Uh, welcome all. I'm already having a feeling I'm going to miss you all from day after tomorrow because of we, we are seeing each other on every day morning for the last three weeks. So today we are at the, almost at the end, uh, last but one day. And today we have a, uh, our a speaker, uh, is Sendil Tyagarajan. Sendil is a director and uh, head of uh, BioRadius uh, Therapeutic Research uh, Organization located in, in Pune. And they have uh, offices uh, all around the place, just a couple of minutes. Uh, he have explained about they have office in Caribbean islands. And uh, Sendil, uh, I will use Sendil only because I, I think Tyagarajan is your father's name, right? <laughs> right, that's I sorry, suffer. sorry. I, was... I also suffer with, this, with the same thing. Everybody uh, address me as Bala Subramanian, but I'm Karthik. Bala Subramanian is my father. It's a patronymic name. So uh, Sendil holds a PhD in neurobiology from Max Planck. After that, uh, uh, he moved uh, to uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in uh, about pharmaceuticals again in Germany. Later on, uh, he moved to start uh, on the industry side uh, related to stem cell research and associated area. And uh, then he started his own company, the BioRadius. So I will not tell much about his research or the story of BioRadius. Uh, Sendil is going to share the same with us. And uh, I welcome him. And the, the floor, or rather screen is yours, Sendil. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. Um, first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to Srinandra sir and to you. Um, so I think it is really great. In fact, uh, when uh, the talk is about my entrepreneurial journey, uh, it also made me to think retrospectively, you know, how I came here, which I did not actively do. Um, so I will I'll describe the process um, as we go along. Um, I have made some sliders. Um, it is, uh, I'm going to show it. Uh, before going into this, I want to have this session really interactive. I think that is how it is going to help all of us. I think everybody is eager and many are looking forward to be an uh, entrepreneur, I guess. So I insist that if anybody wants to ask a question, like, please feel free to stop me. Uh, that way we can have a very productive session is what my uh, request is. Uh, so most of them, Karthik, is uh, like a master students or, or, or how is it? Like I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are masters and uh, some have PhD and uh, working as a, a, a faculty in colleges or universities. Okay. Okay. And uh, they are very, uh, they, they ask a lot of questions. So you. It's like, oh, that's that's wonderful. That's that's what so I, I like. Typically, to... we we have the speaker to speak, and then last fifteen minutes we keep the session, question answer session. In case if you want them to talk in between, also it's yeah. I would I would like it like on the go, like, like people can stop me, maybe like uh, they, they can ask me a question that way. Like we won't lose the connection, you know. Like uh, no problem. Is what so, I like it. But yeah. Yeah. So participants, uh, if you want to stop Sendil anywhere, like you know, you just raise your hand, then we can unmute you. Then please go ahead and. Uh, you know, we can uh, allow the question, so don't worry about it. And I will also uh, check the chat session. And if I want to periodically take some question also, it's fine. Wonderful. So then before I go into that, I want to show a small short video of three minutes of what BioRadius is exactly. Would that be okay? Fine. Uh, absolutely fine, Sandil. Please share your screen. Okay. I'm, I'm just now uh, doing that. of fast-growing, quality-driven global now. Located just 120 kilometers from the commercial capital of India, Mumbai. Money in Pune. Biogradius CRO. A CRO where research matters the most. An independent CRO with no binding to any pharmaceutical company. 
Dutch Bar and EMA study. Strict project timeline adherence. Experienced and qualified scientists and staff. Spacious and frequently supplied clinical facility. round the clock to ensure subject safety. State of the art IC unit and dedicated emergency operator if combined technical experience of more than 100 plus years. Subject safety compliance. We are in the city using oral dosage form like tablets, suspension, micro, supplement lozenges. Okay, so hope that was good. I mean, did you, uh, I mean, the video went well? Yes. Okay, good. So now we will go into the presentation. Any questions now? I would like to take it here and then we'll move forward on this presentation. Anybody have any questions? I think Sentil, we can go, go ahead with the presentation. Okay, okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so like, um, yeah, as I said, like, I mean, this presentation is important to me as well, because I'm uh, retrospectively thinking what brought me to this place that I'm here right now. Um, so I try to put together things uh, about my journey, like, uh, you know, how it went. In fact, when I was asked to give a talk about this entrepreneurship, the first thing I did in fact, is to check what entrepreneurship is all about. So I just Googled it out and then I found uh, this as the definition a dictionary says about, right? So it says that uh, it's an activity of setting up a business or businesses, taking on financial risks in the hope of profit. Uh, well, there are several things which is right here. Like, of course, uh, it's about setting up a business and running it, sustaining it. And then, of course, there are lots of financial risks involved into it. Uh, but where I would like to differ a little bit is the hope of profit. It's not just the profit, you know, like uh, in my case, of course, the profit, if you talk about it, everybody is uh, for money, a business is done for money. But that is not the sole motive of it, or it's not the only hope that drives an entrepreneur into this uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, for me, if I really think about it, the main things that I was thinking when I was doing a nine to five job or when I was a researcher working on the bench is all about having a, a sense of achievement 
you know it's in some way it is very similar like i think there are a lot of phd uh, uh, researchers here postdoc researchers here like i mean i always think of this as an experiment during my old days uh, when i was doing my phd when you finish an experiment very successfully uh, it's not you always don't think about uh, you know, the bigger picture of it, you just think about that experiment and how it ended well. It's, it's a kind of, you know, like a, a sense of achievement, you know, it's a, in one way, entrepreneurship is also that, you know, you set up a business, you see it, uh, it is your brainchild, you grow it, and then it comes to a place with, where it can, you know, self-grow itself. I think that is a kind of uh, sense of achievement that you take pride in, and that becomes a kind of a kick for you to follow on. Um, so for example, I started it very small. Um, I did lots of trial and errors. I tried several businesses all on, on uh, with the scientific background to it because we are basically uh, researchers, biologists. Um, we tried a lot, not everything worked, but then the ones that worked, it really gave you a sense of achievement. That is something that, uh, that drove me if I retrospectively think about it. And of course, value creation. The value creation can be multiple things. It's not just about the brand that you are creating, uh, which is one definitely. And also the value creation in terms of employment, you know, like uh, that adds, like we are now 70 people team uh, right now at BioRadius. But I have seen that growing from five people to 70 people till today. And that's kind of a value creation for me, not only the assets that we create, not, not just the brand that we create, that value creation is very dear to me. Like uh, when I have a chance now, I always try to add in uh, more people. And uh, we have this kind of uh, family atmosphere here, like everybody works, everybody extends their hours to work without asking. So that I consider as value creation. And then of course, when you have a company, it is uh, definitely going to be bigger than life for you. It's just not, uh, you set it up. Uh, I mean, I, I will talk about this in detail. I mean, uh, when you are working in a regulated business, there are two kinds of business. If you ask me uh, from my experience, I would broadly classify science-based business into regulated and non-regulated, right? Uh, I always chose to follow regulated business because uh, the guidelines are stronger. Uh, you can follow a path which is less strenuous. Of course, it is strenuous when you say it is a regulated market because you have to follow lots of SOPs, guidelines, and stuff like that. But then you know the clear picture. I mean, how you want to go, where you want to go. So um, that way, when you set up a regulated business, uh, it is bigger than life. You have to put in a lot of effort because you will be audited by uh, various um, regulatory agencies, very strict these days now, USFTA, for example. Uh, you might see in the papers, uh, you might read about like Lupin getting a 483, which is like, uh, uh, which is like a no go from the regulatory guys about a product or about your manufacturing process. Um, so these are all like, uh, once you get involved into it, it's bigger than life problem. You have to deal with it. You have to run it throughout the life of the company in a good way so that you don't get into any regulatory problems. And then, of course, escaping monotony. I mean, uh, for me, if you personally ask me, I'm a guy like I don't want to do the same work again and again. I get bored very fast. I think these four things together uh, brought me to the place uh, where I am today and where BioRadius is today. And uh, so that's where I want to differ from this hope of profit thing. I mean, uh, that is what the definition was given. So I just wanted to put in forward here. And then again, if you ask me, are this the four things that drive an entrepreneur? I would say no, it, it depends on every single person. It's like uh, no one's to fit all kind of, right? So it, it differs uh, so much. So that's what I wrote you. There is no one recipe, you know, there is no one way of doing things. And that is only your way. For me, like this worked out, this is what I liked and this is how I brought it in, in place. Uh, for some people, it can be just a hope of profit too. I mean, there is nothing wrong in it. Um, so it all depends is what I uh, personally think. So, so one thing that I would like to um, um, suggest or advise is it is not definitely going to be an easy thing. Like there is no way that uh, everything falls in place, even though you have plans. Um, I have seen, I have worked with lots of entrepreneurs. I have worked with lots of businessmen, um, uh, both from scientific background as well as non-scientific background. Uh, there are always plans and uh, there are always plans, right? And then uh, when 
things start, uh, you can't really say, however good your plan is, everything is fall in place. For example, we always start with the projection, right? I mean, in, in any business, like you start with the projection. You say that, oh, in uh, 2021, it is going to look like this. 22, it is any, any good entrepreneur or a businessman or a finance guy will have a five years of projections. But those are projections, not promises, right? I mean, even a very good plan cannot provide you a projection that is 100% foolproof. And it, because there are lots of variable things in any business, <clears throat> um, it can be starting from COVID, nobody expected COVID, right? I mean, like uh, COVID is like a nail on lots of uh, uh, businesses. Uh, uh, if you see talk about uh, food business, nobody thought a food business would take such a hit, but then uh, COVID brought that in. Uh, likewise, you can't really predict all those things. It happens and then an entrepreneur is always ready for it. Uh, although you have your projection, you should be able to you know, change it and move forward with <clears throat> what um, uh, time throws it in. So I would always say being an entrepreneur is not easy. And it's also uh, the most difficult piece of entrepreneurship, if you ask me, is to know when to stay still and also know when to evolve and pivot into something big. Uh, this I have seen personally, it is, it is from my personal experience I'm talking about this, maybe people have different uh, experience and opinions. But in my case, it's also about uh, when you have to stay put. Uh, it is not an easy thing. Like, I mean, when, when, when I talk about it, like, oh, stay still is easy, right? I mean, anybody can stay still. But then when you have invested a lot, not only just money, your time, effort and everything, uh, you always have this pressure coming top down. You know, you have to do something. You have to move from A to B. This is something, if you want to be an entrepreneur, it is something that is always going to stick around on your brain. You know, like uh, this continuous thought that tells you to move from A to B, right? But then sometimes you should know when to say no to that thought and stay put where you are, because maybe that is the best thing that you can do for, uh, for a time. Um, in my experience, that is one of the important things is what um, I always feel. So I do not move forward until unless I see a clear picture and I have some backup to it. And this is one of the important things. I have seen many people falling prey to this. I mean, okay, the business is going very well. Maybe this is the time for expansion. But before doing a good analysis, people try to push it forward to an A to B. And that is when um, all, all bad things uh, start to happen. So this is something that I would like to put as, uh, as an advice, right? And then the most important thing, like as I told you, I have done a lot of trial and error uh, during my time uh, to become a businessman. I have done several things. Uh, probably if you type in my name and uh, do a Zaba research, you would see that there are some eight businesses running on my name, but not, of, not all of them are real success, right? Uh, I talk about a few projects here, probably in the next slides. Uh, those are the ones that really are going well, but the other things are um, I'm sitting duck basically. Like, uh, but that's what I always think that creating a business is easy. You know, like you have a capex, you have an idea, it's all good. You know, in the paper, everything looks good, and especially for scientists, I don't know like uh, about you all, but for me, uh, numbers makes me anxious, right? I mean, like I'm I'm not a finance person. I'm a, I'm a biologist by nature, so. When I sit with my CA or a CFO, and then when they put the numbers on the paper, it makes me dizzy. I don't want to look into those uh, numbers, but actually this is one of the important things. Um, that is, I most of the time think that maybe that is where I have to grow myself to learn more about numbers because numbers tell you uh, something your logics cannot say, uh, your um, rational thinking cannot say. So I would suggest that uh, the, the learning the numbers is very important when you are setting up a business. And then when I'm talking about sustaining a business, the most difficult part is not creating it. The most difficult part is sustaining it. It takes a lot of um, amount of energy, money, time, everything, you know, like uh, it's not a hit and run business. When, when you have put in your effort to create a regulated business, then it is going to ask you a lot for sustaining it. So definitely you should have a plan on it and how you want to deal with it. You have to be always, so when we do like um, a business plan or something, there was always the best case scenario and not so best case scenario and worst case scenario. 
And these three definitely are important to sustain a, a business. So I, I would suggest that that is what is somebody have to look into it. If somebody is wanting to set up a business, it's not just creating it, having a way to sustain the business for a minimum number of period, you know. So I tried to, uh, because I was been, I have been asked uh, to do this, like how I came to entrepreneurship uh, throughout my days. So if you see, like uh, I started with my bachelor's, right? I did my bachelor's in microbiology and then I did my master's in biochemical technology, both at Madurai Kamaraj University. Uh, in fact, we are not, I mean, like uh, I come from a family where nobody was uh, a businessman before me. Right? So business is not in our blood. I started as, as um, you know, life science student. I started with a bachelor's in microbiology and master's in biochemical technology. And that is where uh, the master's in bio biochemical technology definitely gave me a good platform to evolve from there on. Um, it put me uh, um, into a place where I can get a lot of exposure. I did it from Madurai Kamaraj University School of Biological Sciences. I think, I mean, I don't know now how it is, but then uh, during my time, it was one of the best institutes to go for uh, any biological sciences. And uh, definitely that uh, gave me a lot of exposure of, uh, of about things that happens in you know, Europe or uh, US. And uh, we were fascinated, all of our team, I mean, all of our uh, classmates were very fascinated to do a PhD in, uh, in, uh, sorry, in, in somewhere else like other than India. So that's how I ended up uh, for my PhD at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Brain Research. Um, I worked under one of the uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Sackman, who is a uh, Nobel laureate for electrophysiology. So I did my PhD in brain research where I learned a lot of things. Uh, what I now, uh, when I retrospectively think about uh, how I came into business, I always attribute that to the logical thinking a PhD can give you. You know, like many people told me, oh, you, you, you are doing at Max Planck, you are doing a postdoc in Max Planck, and then you've been a scientist at uh, Abbott Pharmaceuticals, which are all in Germany. I, I did almost nine years. I spent nine years in uh, uh, Germany doing PhD postdoc and working there for a while. Uh, so many people are surprised why why you have to take a shift. Like, I mean, you've been working in Abbott. Of, of course, Abbott is one of the biggest pharma companies, if you know. And uh, that is a, a regular question that I have. I was asked when we plan to move to India and look into an industry side. Uh, but then, I mean, people always say that, oh, you lost that, uh, you know, what the learning that you did in PhD postdoc, because it was in neuroscience, neurobiology, and what I'm doing is a little different. In fact, a lot of... Uh, different thing other than what I learned in my PhDs and postdocs. It's a good five years that I have spent there and uh, I'm not making use of it is what I sometimes hear from people. Uh, but then if I really think I, that is not the case, you know, PhD is not just about one particular um, subject or about one research problem. For me, it is all about how you train your brain to look at a problem and how you solve it. You know, that is not just applicable only to the research problem you hold it in your hand. It is about everything in life. Like today, like we face every day some problem, right, in business. Uh, sometimes this learning that I, I got from PhD and postdoc helps me. I mean, I put it in the paper. I see all the sides of the problem. And then I'll try to see where the root cause of the problem comes from. I try to solve it in a different way. I think that is one of the main reasons, if, if, if I really look back at it, uh, how I grew faster and how I become an entrepreneur. So if somebody is telling you that uh, because you are a PhD or a postdoc, you have, to, you have to be on the same line, I beg to differ there. Uh, those things have already given you a lot of power than you really know. And uh, it is just about how we use those uh, analytical thinking we have learned, logical thinking we have learned throughout this to put into a business and make it grow. I think we are not so far away from anything is what I think. And then, yeah, but there was one thing that when um, I was doing my PhD and postdoc um, I, in Germany, we were planning to come back to India for good. I mean, it's for personal reasons, nothing to do with uh, anything else. And that time we had some problems because um, um, like coming back to academics was, wasn't uh, looking so good for us um, in terms of finance. And we had some different lookouts uh, when we want to settle back in India. So that is the reason I took a jump uh, from academics to industry. 
uh, because when I tried to apply for industry from uh, Germany, like uh, the academics uh, experience was not considered as an industrial experience, right? So it was a no starter for me. So I had to uh, do something in Germany to develop my um, industrial experience. That's how I, I thought of jumping from Max Planck to Abbott. So I become a scientist uh, for a drug discovery laboratory in Abbott and I was working there for uh, two years. And just to gain experience and to learn uh, what an industry looks like, right? Uh, it has its, uh, uh, you know, lots of uh, positives and negatives as well. Um, the positives being, well, you are in an industry, it is more regulated, like uh, every single thing is more regulated. Uh, you sometimes even feel that some of the freedom has gone along with your basic research, you know. Um, but then you also know that you are working on a translational research, you know, which you can see that going into the market. And that kind of gives you a different sense of achievement. Uh, oh, yeah. So like, for example, even now, like we see some medicines in market, uh, we say, oh, this is the study that we did, uh, did at Bioradius, you know, like uh, it was approved by USFDA, but the study has been done at Bioradius. So that's kind of a sense of achievement, right? You can directly link it. Uh, that product is ours, kind of, although it's not ours, it's the sponsors, pharmaceuticals. We have been working on that product, so we know it is ours. So that kind of sense of achievement that definitely comes with it uh, when you work with an industry. Uh, but again, it is kind of a nine to five job right and in, in, in a pharma company especially in germany i do not know how it is in india i never worked in a big company in india but then in, in germany it's a nine to five you come at nine you go at five you do some work but you do not know really the uh, head and tail of, of of the product that you are working on because you know everything is uh, about confidentiality in an in an industry so that uh, was one of the limitations of course but then after this particular um job helped me to land a job in India as a laboratory director for a stem cell company. It's a biotech company in called Biotech, where I was taken as a laboratory director. So I oversee, uh, I did oversee everything like uh, from starting up the laboratory to how to end the stem cells to the clients. So till then I was seeing everything. It's a small company. We were like probably a 50 uh, uh, number company it was. And but that gave me, if you really see, that is the platform that I learned everything. Um, I, I came to Pune, I took this job um, as the laboratory director. I learned everything from A to Z basically there because uh, I had a lot of freedom, which I didn't have in Abbott uh, because you cannot work cross department in, in Abbott. It's a big company, like everybody have their set of job their set of duties and their set of responsibilities. So you cannot do anything out of the way. But uh, when I came to this small company, I learned a lot because I was putting my head and uh, brain into everything basically that I can find interesting. I did from accounts to, I did uh, till lab work, till business development. So probably I did everything, uh, which, which gave me a lot of perspective into how uh, businesses ran, what are the problems, how you face every vendor that you meet, all, all those kind of things. I think I, I, I got that from, from Encode Biotech. I think if you ask me, that is where I learned the most out of all. Well, then when I wanted to make a move, that uh, experience came hand in hand. And that's how I started my um, entrepreneurship. You know, and then I didn't start right away with Bioradius. Uh, Bioradius is quite an intensive um, uh, investment uh, required company, basically. Like, uh, so I didn't want to immediately jump into the water. I wanted to test the waters a little bit before uh, getting deep into it. Um, so that's how we started Bioclin Research. Uh, it is also a clinical research facility. I had some partners. Um, I selected a few partners and we, uh, together started uh, this bioclin research LLP. We did lots of studies for lupin pharmaceuticals. And uh, that is also um, a good learning uh, curve for me. I learned a lot of things. I seen problems that I would have never witnessed it in any of my previous jobs. And uh, it taught me how to overcome it, how to arrange your finance, how to work on when there is no finance available. So all those uh, valuable things I learned through bioclinical research. And then I wanted to go full-fledged. I, I, I get the knack of it. I like the idea of being an entrepreneur. 
where you have all the freedom to probe any possibility that uh, life throws at you. So that that part I really liked it there, and that's how I, we started Novomed Research Institute and Bioradius Therapeutic Research. Um, so uh, yeah, Bioradius Therapeutic Research is uh, located here in Pune, Hinchabadi. Novomed Research Institute is in Trinidad and Tobago. It's in Caribbean Island. Right. Uh, Bioclin research is no more. In fact, Bioclin research has been converted into Bioradius therapeutic research. And the Bioradius is now uh, going strong. We have a lot of um, uh, clients, uh, clients in the sense pharmaceutical companies who are working with us, national and international. And uh, we, file, we have filed a lot of studies, uh, lots of products with uh, several regulatory uh, agencies. So, I mean, I have extended this line so that, I mean, I still have lots of ideas to go forward to it. But as, as I told you in the slides before, it is also, you should know when to stay still and when you want to evolve, when you have to evolve, that also you should know. So I kept the line extended. So maybe I'm planning to add a few dots for there. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, if, if I really think back, um, um, as I told you in, in the previous uh, thing, it's not like a one should fit all kind of a thing, right? I mean, uh, what worked for me might not work for you, but anyway, hearing out from different people uh, will help you in, in, in place and a time that you might not even think it will help you, right? So what I try to put in here is what helped me throughout uh, the time. See, I mean, if you really see, uh, I was thinking deep into it, like when I was making this presentation. In fact, I was not very vocal about all this. In fact, uh, this presentation helped me to see how I came to this place. So I tried to put all those things into these four categories where I think, which, which is my strength, I guess. Um, that's what I try to put in here. And of course, anybody and everybody can uh, deny it like because I was when searching for this uh, thing I always go with the flow right I mean like I don't I'm I'm not a big fan of negotiating against the force I, I try uh, uh, to go with the flow uh, but then people all also say that it's only the dead fish that goes with the flow right um, so I know for sure many people have different uh, things but for me uh, I never tried anything opposing the force of, of, of a normal flow. I was a PhD student, I was a postdoc, and that flow brings you a force in you, right? And you have to, at the most, what I did is I went with the flow, I adapted myself a little bit, or I steered a little bit and used the force of flow to get me to a place where I want to be. And it worked very well for me. But there are people who go against the flow and do things. That is also okay. I mean, like this is in my case scenario. Okay. Um, so for me, that is the case. I went with the flow. I adjusted the flow. I adjusted the, I used the force and adjusted myself. And I uh, kept target of where I want to reach. And I always use the force of the flow. That's what I did. Um, and I'm also not a big fan of um, elaborate plannings. Um, in fact, I changed lots of CAs and CFOs based on that because they, they put an elaborate planning. And uh, for me, if you ask me, it's my personal opinion. You cannot do so much of a planning after one point of time because you cannot guess all the variables. There are variables, of course, you have to consider in your plan. When, when I say a simple plan, it's not that today I start a business, tomorrow I win. That is not a simple plan. Right, uh, a simple plan should take into consideration all the variables. But again, if somebody sits on the variables for uh, two months, you can come with lots of variables and you would never move from one point to another point. So for me, it's check the waters, feel it, and then just jump into it. And that's how I did. Like, I mean, it worked for me. Uh, but some people also say that you have to have an elaborate planning, but I'm not a big fan of it, but it, it has worked for me till now. Uh, I don't know how it is going to moving forward, uh, but I just keep my plan very simple. I see what are all the problems that can potentially stop the business. I try to avoid those. I consider that in the plan. And uh, if there are hundred variables, I consider only five variables that might stop me immediately. And then I move forward from there. That's how I do it. And besides that, the trial and error method, this is, this is definitely, definitely important. I don't think there is no, there's anyone who can go to a success, successful entrepreneurship without this trial and error method. And it's all about not getting disheartened 
when you are failing in, a, in, in one of your uh, things. So as I told you, if you search my name, you would come up with lots of uh, um, companies. Not every, every one of them are working really good. But then that is the trial and error method for me. I was, I'm, I'm still, I mean, I, I still plan to start so many things. I still plan to evolve into something else, but then it can be always failing as well. So I'm, I'm okay with it. But then if you're not trying it, if you're not doing a trial and error method, I think uh, it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur. And then the last one, as I told you, sustaining the business is what the most difficult thing than creating it. Creating it is easy if you have a capex and an idea, right? I mean, somebody believes in you, somebody funds you, or you put your own funds, uh, it can be started anytime. There is nothing stopping you. But then sustaining is all about keeping one step at a time. This is how I do it. Like um, the, the business that we are in is uh, very um, fun intensive, right? I mean, like uh, we, we every day we see almost like uh, 100 subjects. We have to pay them every day uh, for 100 subjects for participating in one study or the other study. Um, uh, all, all the studies require some kind of, uh, you know, forward cash to be put in before we get uh, money from the clients. So sustaining it needs a uh, lots of perseverance. You have not only physically, mentally, as well as financially. Uh, and how I see it is when doing difficult times, I just put one step forward at a time. I just push it. Sometimes that is all that it needs. Um, when you make small, small steps to reach your target, even when you are under immense pressure on always, but don't stop. Don't, don't be still. Just keep one step forward and try to evolve. That is what I always did. And it always helped me. Yeah. So if you ask me what helped me uh, or how, what all I followed, I think I can summarize this in this four uh, blocks that I have put in. I always went with the flow. I had a simple plan, but an effective plan. I, I took care of it. And then I did lots of trial and error. I, I lost several projects, but the ones that worked, that worked really well. And the failed projects also is a mentor to you. It teaches you a lot of things, how to do it right, the projects that you have in hand. And then I always, when in difficulty, I move one step at a time. This is what I've been always doing it. So with that, I want to, um, uh, if, I, if I have to suggest to you guys anything, probably this is what I want to tell you. Um, I find lots of students that I'm, I'm also into, you know, uh, giving a kind of um, internships and, and I make sometimes tailored uh, programs in clinical research. And I see a lot of uh, students coming to me um, just after their BSc or MSc, inform, PhD, or even like doctors. Um, what I find most of the time is they narrow down to a subject too quick. I think it's not needed. I mean, like uh, when I was working in stem cells, when I'm working in stem cells, people come to me and say like, uh, I want to do PhD in stem cell biology or in mesenchymal stem cells or some hematopoietic stem cells. So I, I, I usually ask them like, why do you want to do particularly in mesenchymal stem cells? Uh, they say, oh, I said, I, I like it so much, you know, like I like mesenchymal stem cells. And you cannot like mesenchymal stem cells, right? I mean, it's, it's a cell. I mean, um, I don't know, like keeping your scientific knowledge broad will always help you. It is, I think it's too soon to narrow down to a protein, to a cell, for a PhD or even for a postdoc, I think like, I mean, for me, when I was doing my PhD, well, I went for brain research, but I did almost six different projects in my PhD, right? And some of them came into uh, 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 published as a paper, but then some never made it. But then I was doing several things. I was doing retroviral vector gene therapy. I was making transgenic animals. I was working on molecular biology, like clonings. I did a lot of clonings. I was doing immunocide. I mean, I, I was always trying to learn a lot of techniques, you know, that, uh, that definitely helped me. You know, you can always narrow down to it when you come to a stage where you have really learned all and you want to focus on one thing that you like it. But when you are planning to take your PhD, you are, you are very naive, right? I mean, uh, you cannot just uh, think I mean, people just go sometimes like uh, because of the big names they hear. 
uh, when I was doing my PhD, it was gene therapy, right? I mean, everybody was talking about gene therapy. Uh, they said it is going to be the biggest thing after so many era. But then where is gene therapy now? Gene therapy is just one disease, cystic fibrosis that got approved. The rest, people come to know that it's just replacing one gene won't help because we are multisystronic, right? And then uh, now it's all about stem cell biology. Everybody talks about stem cells. Oh, stem cells is going to heal that, this and that. But I've been in stem cells for a long time. I know it's advantages and disadvantages. And I don't think so. Somebody have to be narrowed down onto a particular problem so much in a very short time. I think it takes time to learn everything. It gives you a lots of, you know, um, uh, rational thinking, you will understand so many things. And then when you are in a position to narrow it down, uh, that, that, that's the time that you should take this call is what I think. So keep it broad and learn everything that you can get in your plate. And then that is that will help you in a long way. And yeah, of course. So uh, if you are looking as an entrepreneur, then probably you have to take calculated risks. It's not just risks. You should take calculated risks. You know, You should know how far you can go and when you have to leave, that is uh, uh, very important. And then sometimes uh, people hold on to the vanity of, of business. I'm talking especially on the business point of view. You have set up something. Uh, people do a lot of things for the vanity sake, like they want to make the office so bright. They want to make, uh, it, it depends, like it depends on the business, right? If your business asks only for X, you should give them X plus one, that is okay. You don't have to give X plus 100, it's not needed. I have seen many of my friends uh, who started uh, several other uh, businesses, not in the same field as well as in other fields, they gave off to vanity, they built something that is not necessarily needed for that business. Um, so that asks you for lots of things, you know, like you have, it's not today, if I set up a business, it's not just I want to put the CapEx money and start it. I have to fund it over the period of time. So the more money you reserve in your hand, it's going to help you over the time, right? So that is something important. And as I told you before, plan it simple and keep it measurable. Whatever the plans that you want to make, you have to have a way to measure it if the plan is going in the right way or not. I think that is uh, so very important. And then given all this, you have to be always with your open eyes. Uh, you should know when the opportunity knocks in. And as I wrote you, it always comes in a gift pack. Most of my projects, which ones that took off well, uh, they always come in in, in in the form of a problem. You know, like people talk about this problem, oh, this is a problem, so we cannot go go ahead with this. This project is done. It has so much of complexity. But then that is what everybody feels it. And that's where the opportunity that you have. So you probably have to open that gift and see what this problem is, where it is coming. And here I again think the, the, the analytical thinking that you have learned from your PhD and postdoc might be a good resource for you to help you with this uh, problem. So it helped for me. So I'm just putting it forward. And then this also I told you when in difficult times, move forward with one step at a time. It is very, very important. It might look very uh, negligible, but believe me, when you are an entrepreneur, when you are facing the problems, which you will definitely, and that is the time that you have to think on this, move forward with one step at a time. It will always help you. You will think that you won't reach it, but then the one step you take every day, that will definitely help you. Yeah. And then face the problems. Uh, many people are afraid of it. I was so afraid of facing my problems, especially the financial ones. Um, but I think the best way of dealing a problem is facing the problem. That is what I have learned all along. Now I'm all up to it. So I, I face the problem. If, if I can't, if I couldn't pay a vendor in time, I go to them and tell them that I cannot pay you in time. I'll pay you next time. Uh, this is all simple, but this all kind of things that you would face when you are an entrepreneur. So it's better to be ready with this, right? And then the last thing is to know when it's time to let it go. Uh, this many people, uh, or, or maybe few people, don't do this. They 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 know because you know you have invested lots of your time, energy, money. Not only your time, your family's time. Your family is heavily invested in you. Your friends are invested in you. So when you set up a project, when you start to take it on, or it's going on for five years, and then it goes into a problem, you couldn't recover it. You tried everything. Some people just stuck to it because they have done so much. They don't want that to go waste. But then it is also um, brilliant thinking to know when it is time to let it go. 
and uh, of course we cannot control everything so that is one of the things that we have to remember so with all this it is not definitely a recipe for success, right? I mean, this is, these are the, some things that I faced and uh, I think are the right ones. But then again, as I show you in the right side of it, like you have to keep trying doing this again and again for several projects sometimes. But then uh, if you are a true entrepreneur, you would uh, do that and you definitely will come to success. Yeah, so I think uh, that's all I wanted to share. I'm open for questions now. So like anything you guys might ask for. Thanks, Anthil. Thanks Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. There are some questions in the chat session. Okay. Yeah, perhaps uh, Senthil can stop sharing his screen so people can see him. Okay, just a minute. I'm stop sharing it. Wonderful talk, Senthil. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I wish I had heard it 40 years back. <laughs> Okay, so so the first question, uh, yeah, we will uh, see. Yeah. We will take. I will read it. Yeah, please read it. Uh, yeah, Mayuri Rege has a question. How did you identify the biotech space in which you wanted to set up your business, especially since you have a, a neuroscience by, a research background? Yeah, um, thank you, Mary, for that question. So as I told you, like, uh, I never saw myself like, um, um, so that is one of the points, in fact, I made in my uh, thing, right? I didn't want to narrow down on anything at all. Uh, you know, like, um, uh, for, for example, I am, I'm more into stem cells, right? More than clinical research. Um, I have uh, worked a lot on stem cells. And then when I wanted to set up a company, I had this thought whether I should plan and set up a stem cell laboratory or I should work on clinical research. See, clinical research and stem cells go hand in hand. We have done lots of clinical trials on stem cells, right? So, but even then there is, these are two different uh, businesses. So then when I was thinking about it, for me, I do not come from um, you know, a cash rich family. And I do not also wanted, uh, I did not want to go to um, a finance institution and get lots of finance for my, uh, for my, um, uh, for my setup. Uh, that is mainly because uh, the EMIs and, and the loans will kill the business in the initial year. So I didn't want to do it. So I had these two things, like whether I want to go into stem cells, nor into clinical research. Now, I didn't want to narrow down on stem cells because I just have a lot of work done on stem cells. So there, what I decided is I, I'm planning to do a business, right? I can do tomorrow stem cells if I am successful in a business which brings me funds over the time and doesn't bleed me heavy on my pocket. So I thought if I set up a stem cell laboratory, what is the business reach I can go for? And if I set up a clinical research laboratory, what is the um, reach, market reach I can go for? And definitely I am not for the IP based, um, um, I, I, patent based or IP based uh, uh, businesses because it's a long-term thing, right? I mean, you cannot just invent an IP and then go for funding with it like in, within a year or two. So I wanted uh, some industry where I can put in my effort and then also take money from the market. And that is how I decided basically on clinical research because it's a service sector. Stem cells is a research sector. There are sectors, I mean, like you have to always think when you are planning on, an, on your entrepreneurial journey, there are research-based businesses, there are service-based businesses, both are in the biology spectrum, right? But then there are two categories. I always tend to go on a service sector because you can provide service and get paid for it, which is important for, for, for a business like us when we start new, when you do not have any business backup or support, I think, the faster your company stands on its feet is easier for you. So that is the reason I selected clinical research. Now, everything is research. It's just different kind of research and what sector you are in. Clinical research is a service sector. And that's how I went into it. As I told you, I was not ready to narrow down on neuroscience or stem cells because I learned a lot from, uh, I, I did lots of work on it. I would definitely now incorporate neuroscience or stem cells into the clinical research thing where I bring back my, you know, um, all my expertise into it. But then you cannot put that first and get the business later. 
Uh, that's how I decided. I hope it answered you or I can make clear myself more. Yes, that was very clear. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, yeah. One minute. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of switching different different domain in an uh, entrepreneurship journey as in what's better be a journalist or a specialist? Um, so, yeah, so what is advantage or dis disadvantage of uh, shifting through domains is what you're asking? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. See, the advantage, I wouldn't say immediately. The disadvantage is, of course, if, you, if for example, if somebody talks to me about um, stem cells or neuroscience, I probably will understand most of it and probably I can replay a lot of it. Right. But then when I move to clinical research, it's it's not it's not like my domain, right? I'm entering into another domain. And there I have to heavily depend on the recruitments I'm making. I did recruit 20 years, 25 years of experience people have had in that field, right? I took experts basically, and uh, I had to believe on them uh, to run the business. But then that is that disadvantage. You have to believe on somebody, right? But what I did is I learned that very quickly. Um, probably in, in, in a year's time, I know like uh, the ins and outs of it. Like at least I, I, I learned everything that I can manage myself, even if I do not have an expert guiding me. Um, that I did very fast. Disadvantage is this, that you might not be the expert and you need somebody's guidance. Advantage, I don't think as such, there is no any advantage of moving from domain to domain uh, unless it has some business along with it. For me, I moved from stem cells to clinical research because I saw a better business opportunity in clinical research than stem cells. And uh, so that is that is the advantage that I saw in clinical research and that's why I jumped. So you have to compensate somewhere, you know, like uh, you cannot do everything and anything in your own sphere that is not possible. Like you have to extend your hand here or there. Um, so that, that's the advantage and disadvantage. Uh, one more question from Naveen. Uh, how you got opportunity to go to Germany and continue your higher education? Well, there is this, um, after my master's in biochemical technology, I think there is still this fellowship is open. I, uh, I think the timelines are also around this month of the year. Uh, it is called International uh, Max Planck Research School, right? I mean, it's um, uh, there are some stipends from this uh, research school, basically. And they invite application from uh, students. So we did, um, uh, I applied for it. And then they called us for an interview. There were some 24 people who were called throughout, I mean, from the world. And then there were like eight positions open. So I went for this interview to Max Planck. It is in Frankfurt. And then um, after that screening, I got passed and they uh, took me for uh, the PhD, basically. And that's how once I got PhD, it was easy for me to move on through postdocs and uh, other job there itself. Because in fact, uh, we lived there, like, I mean, um, my kids were born there and, and stuff like that. So it was easy for us to extend it further. Hello. Yeah. I uh, another one question is there. Yes. Uh, Snehal is asking, what is the one thing that academics often get it wrong while getting into an industrial space? Okay, so what they take it wrong. Yeah, I mean, for me, it is all about taking it lightly, I guess. Um, so let's see, I mean, we, I, I think it is one of our strengths as well in academics or basic research for that matter is that there's a lot of freedom, right? Um, you, uh, for, for doing a research, I mean, um, we have a lot of freedom. We can work around things. We can, uh, um, you know, like uh, brainstorm, we can change the project a little bit. All those things are strength that we get uh, with basic research. But then when you move on to industry, it's like you have been tied, you know, you have uh, been tied and given a particular job to do. Uh, there is no much space to move around. There is no much space to put your imagination into it, uh, at least initially, till you go to reach to a position where you can develop your own projects. Uh, but that is the main thing that every, I, I felt it on my face, basically. Like So when I moved from Max Planck to Abbott Pharmaceuticals in Germany, that is the first thing that um, 
uh, that came um, right to my face that I do not have much of a freedom. You know, I don't, when, when I was in Max Planck, I was doing a lot of projects. None of, many of the projects are not even listed like oh, that I will be doing it. But uh, I found that interesting and went to my professor. I said that, oh, uh, um, doctor, this looks really good. I think we should follow up. And then it was easy. And we did lots of projects like that. But then when you go to an industry, it, when you, especially if you are working on some confidential project, you can forget about the freedom at all because they tell you, okay, there is a compound coming to you you have to screen it, you have to do a set of experiments on it, you have to give the results. That's all. You don't even know sometimes what this compound is. It's marked with some confidential barcodes and labels and whatsoever. So you apply it and that's not fun, right? I mean, like, because we have learned a way that to see every result, interpret every result, and then we know what this could be. And then we refer a lot of literature. Okay. We come back with our hypothesis. Those things are a little, um, little uh, you know cut end uh, in in industry i think that is the main problem that we face yeah ashwini wanted to uh, say something yeah. or ask a question ashwini you can unmute yourself and ask the question yeah actually my question is uh, answered by i mean it's asked by some other uh, participant whether um, the specialist is uh, uh, required or uh, generalist is required nowadays <laughs> Okay, I, see, specialist, I mean, if you're talking about industry, are you talking about industry? Actually? I'm uh, talking about academics. Actually, I faced, uh, I also have the same uh, thought as of you, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I have completed my MA master's in uh, 2018. Uh, but BSc graduation was in horticulture. Then I shifted for MSc in agriculture, genetics, and plant breeding. Mm -hmm. I had also worked on uh, next generation sequencing and also uh, to some extent, I worked on uh, clinical genetics. So overall, I have uh, experience, but when I faced an uh, interview for the PhD, uh, the interviewer questioned me, <laughs> why you changed uh, uh, the fields like that? <laughs> Mm. Okay, I think in your thing, it's a little bit of drastic change, I guess, because from agriculture to, you know, um, uh, to, to clinical side, probably. Um, see, but then if you are looking for a PhD, I think I don't know how it is, but then usually a PhD, you can start afresh, right? I mean, when I started my PhD, like I had no idea of, uh, about that project that I was awarded. I was working on channel rhodopsin 2 and gene therapy. I never did gene therapy, nor on that protein or any of the similar proteins uh, options. I never worked on. But then, uh, yeah, that is also lookout, you know, like uh, uh, that way I somehow feel that it depends on the professor you are talking to. Sometimes uh, they're open-minded. They, they, they just see uh, the analytical ability in you, uh, the, the capacity of you to put a long, uh, long time of work into the project. That's what I think is needed for PhD. I mean, I might be wrong, but then uh, uh, just because changing subjects should not stop you from uh, joining a PhD. PhD is, is where you learn a lot of things, right? I mean, it's it's not a place yeah. where you have already learned and you are going to use the skill that you have learned. It's it's, it's a starting place. I mean, I uh, so it depends on the professors, I think, uh, Ashwini, is what I can tell you. Yes, actually, my main domain is uh, molecular biology and genetics. Right. So both in uh, plants as well as to, to for few months uh, i worked in industry in uh, uh, gen genetic screening of newborn babies right so uh, so basically genetics is genetics and molecular but techniques are techniques so it does. Yeah, that's right so that that's what you should probably stress that out i mean like if you are good with your techniques at the end of the day in phd you are going to use all the techniques to uncover a problem right i mean that is all that it, it's going to ask and yeah, if you yeah 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 please tell me yeah, the organism that we are working, uh, so it doesn't make difference if the techniques are uh, well yeah, learned. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's about how how um, the, your supervisor uh, sees you. Like, I mean, like, uh, if, if you ask me, I wouldn't, if I have to take a PhD student under me, I wouldn't really think so much if, if, if the candidate has uh, the techniques in hand, she knows a lot of techniques or he knows lots of techniques that are relevant to the project and she has the ability to learn things quickly. I think that's all is required for a PhD. Okay, sir, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anuj. Yeah, Anuj is here. Yeah, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
so first of all thanks a lot for such an inspirational talk it's great to hear these things from such uh, experts like that and sir i have one small question that uh, you have mentioned about the uh, internship and all that sir what are the opportunities that uh, are uh, there open for this bio, in bioradius for a uh, young students like us or young budding entrepreneurs like us see i mean we provide internships as well as training programs for select few i mean that is not our um, uh main uh, thing as such but then uh, we started this because we see a lot of death in um, in 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 people like you know we take a lot we hire lots of masters uh, biotech students analytical chemistry students b forms m forms and doctors right and um, many of them like uh, have no idea what uh, cro industry is doing um, and you would be surprised a cro industry is india has got one of its best cro industry throughout the world you know like i mean um, all medicines like from us fda i mean from us uk everything comes down for clinical research to india because we have made a mark there i mean uh, we are one of uh, the best countries for clinical research even then uh, people who come out of um, uh, masters or uh, Uh, b farm m farm they do not have any idea what a clinical research asks for we found that surprising in fact so whenever we had to take or hire people uh, at bio radius we always found that it was very hard to teach them like because they they, they don't have any syllabus uh, related to this although they are a pharmaceutical uh, background people so that's why we started this whole uh, internship program you know to make uh, Uh, easy for our um, hiring as well like we like we take say 10 15 people uh, for an internship and then we run them through one two or three months course and then we train them with sops and whatever and we see like some people are performing really well usually we invite them um, that, that's for this reason that uh, this whole internship thing has started so we have uh, internship in clinical research in medical writing in regulatory affairs and then in biological laboratory so these are the four internships we usually provide okay and sir then one final last question that uh, sir is it okay to have four to five ideas while uh, looking or exploring for these uh, startups and entrepreneurship programs because most of the time the people uh, if you have four to five ideas they think that uh, you are not focused on one thing yes, and you are yes just... i i think i think that is a general thing so you probably have to throw the best what do you think is uh, of your four ideas and uh, push it forward see i mean four ideas at a time it's it's really good sometimes yeah you you will have lots of ideas but then you have to uh, learn to segregate them uh, i don't know like how you are going planning to fund those um, ideas of yours if you are planning to go to a venture capitalist or for that matter if you want to write a grant Uh, so there are uh, several things that you have to take care of it right if you are going to a venture capitalist he is going to see definitely if this uh, project of yours can be multiplied you know that is what mainly a venture capitalist would see or an angel, angel investor whoever it is he will see that the scope of multiplying uh, they don't like like one business and setting it up here they want to see if this can be expanded uh, like multiple times that's what they would see so like this everything has its own asking so if you are having four plans for example you probably select the ones that goes for venture capitalists select the one that has to go for maybe a funding from dbt or whatever so that's how i would arrange it and i i always throw one at a time Uh, of course throwing a lot of uh, things at a time doesn't uh, i mean people think that you are uh, spread thin uh, which is not a good idea definitely no sir actually i have asked that this because uh, there might be a chance that our one idea will not be that successful and that uh, well uh, goes well down to the ground so that's why i am asking because it's like a alternator you have the alternate to shift from one to other ideas no see but now i do not know problem. exactly like uh, if these ideas are related to each other but if it is different ideas there is no way of putting all those four different ideas to one person yeah, yeah. Uh, right i mean if it is see if it's um, backup i mean uh, backup ideas are always good uh, but then if these are all completely different projects i wouldn't do all at four at once i i would, you have to know to select or pick one that you think really have the viability to go forward i mean i think that is the one that i will push forward don't push all four definitely it won't work so thank you and give you round of applause for your presentation sir. thank you thank you a lot uh, snehal wanted to say something uh, snehal you can unmute yourself and ask the question snehal snehal 
and uh, i will now ask sir hello am i audible uh, yes yes you are audible yes uh, hello sir this is sneha here yes hi sneha i did my masters in mgt sbs ncu 2 sorry sorry you did your masters masters from in microbial gene technology sbs madurai kamgad you know oh is it okay gene technology yeah biochemical technology and gene technology are almost close nearby right yes yes yeah. sir Uh, yeah. so so my question was are there any cro uh, virtual courses run by bioradius or are there any certified courses that you would like to suggest to uh, researchers recently see i wouldn't definitely do that uh, snehal because i uh, that is also one of the reasons i told you right like we give internships because there are lots of um, lots of companies that i mean not companies there are lots of institutes that are yes. giving like you know certification courses and uh, and all that in fact uh, i'm completely against it because they are just see they they are all like okay. if you go probably if you go to any of these institutes who offer you like a two months uh, certification course what they are essentially doing is they have just uh, taken this one room uh, place uh, they call it as an institute they they put lots of people inside and then they just teach you on on a powerpoint right well i mean i this kind okay. of uh, thing is already existing in your uh, curriculum like i mean if you talk about m form uh, curriculum yes. it's already there and w- what is the use of it like i mean see here clinical research is all about hand hand in work basically like right you have to yeah. see the sops you have to feel the forms every single thing that you do in clinical research is documented and it's all the documents that will speak about your work because the the study we do i'll i'll give you a small kartik do we have time Uh, go go ahead uh, okay okay so uh, I'm, we are late you just let me know yeah snehal so i was just uh, trying to give you an example okay uh, yes, like sir. today for example we do a study we call it a study right uh, a study is where you check a drug on volunteers on subjects right so we do a study it takes around 2 weeks uh, for us to complete a study where the subjects will come to our clinic they stay in our clinic we dose them with the medicine we check them periodically we take blood we analyze them so this whole process is captured completely on forms and formats right every single yes. thing from the volunteer entering to our uh, doctor touching him everything has to be recorded and then when the study is over we submit this data to the agency regulatory agency they view the data and then they say okay this data is really good this medicine is working good let's approve it and when they yeah. approve it the medicine go into the market right now this is over uh, it's over for the cro it's over for the pharmaceutical company they start making this yeah. drug in bulk and then they keep sending it selling it everywhere us fda or uk or anywhere they want to sell it they will be selling it then retrospectively the audit comes to cro right after 2 years this is after 2 years that you have finished the study yes yeah. cro uh, will be audited for this particular study when they audit it they find a mistake right they find yeah. some mistake which should not have happened which is a grave mistake which affects the study then the fda or any regulatory body have the authority to revoke the products right and they stop the selling of the okay. of the products you okay. see lots of medicines all of a sudden goes off from the pharmacies right that is yes, has sir. to have something like this uh, some problem so now it is a great um it's a great problem to the sponsor to the pharmaceutical company because they have done millions and millions of products they have distributed all over now they have to recall all of them it is go, going to cost them a, a lot and lot right and all this is depending on the cro so that is why pharmaceutical yes. companies take time to trust a cro and give a study to them because if we do something bad with the study it can affect the pharmaceutical company so bad it can okay. cost them millions of dollars and then okay. if you really look into this cro it's all about the candidates who are working here i cannot do so much of it right i i yes. I'm, i sit at the top position i just oversee it it is all the people who are working in there and these guys have to have training in house if they are yes. going to to some some training institute where they just teach uh, that you can even read it from internet like what clinical research yes. is how it is done yes. so i don't really say the certificate courses are working we have lots of candidates who have certificate but still they have to start a fresh you know as a new internship so i don't find credential unless there is one institute which i'm not aware of which is really giving a full hearted um, you know training I, i i do not know of it one yet 
yes so, so for quality i think the in house training is important sorry sorry what did you say for a better cro quality education in yeah, house training is yes it's very important so i don't think your certificate is going to help if, for example tomorrow if you are joining by redis for example you have to still go on a two months training without that you cannot touch anything so you would be still learning everything it's a mandatory like all the sops you have to learn you have to do an exam on it and then only you will be eligible if you are passing only to touch the uh, study subjects or anything so i don't think certificate courses of very help uh, it's my opinion okay thank you all and uh, uh, thanks uh, sendil for this thank you hello. thank you Kat. hello uh, on behalf of uh, ari and uh, kc i th thank sendil for this uh, wonderful lecture and participants for this uh, uh, you know questions thanks sendil thank you for some uh, one uh, uh, sendil there are a lot of uh messages for you coming thank you yeah yeah i'm saying it thanks thank you all I, thank you kartik and uh, thank you everyone thank you surendra sir for uh, uh, thank for you sendil nice. for such a wonderful discourse i'm sure it's going to be useful to the youngsters i hope uh, so sir uh, yeah, yeah wonderful yeah and it also shows uh, how hard you have worked although you have made sound uh, sort of uh, quite easy but uh, any endeavor of this kind would involve a lot of efforts and all that and uh, really good interaction so thanks all the participants for interacting kartik as usual thank you for organizing this wonderfully thank you senthil thank you thank sir you. thank you very much thank, thank you, you so thank you so much uh, audience please stay uh, uh, i have some uh, announcement to make so uh, the first and foremost thing uh, we have shared our uh, feedback form uh, please uh, it, you can fill the form anonymous also you do not necessarily you have to put your name or anything like that and one of you please uh, please uh, share the form in your whatsapp group so uh, please uh, fill the form with what you like what you uh, like good about our course or whatever please do it good to your uh, whatever you feel and um, so it would help us to correct our mistake if any in the future courses first thing and then uh, please fill the form by today evening only so we have uh, uh, we we have some time to discuss about this tomorrow so you know what if we have some doubts we can uh, get it uh, rectified it tomorrow that is the first announcement and second thing uh some of you please come forward to talk i already got anuj is going to talk tomorrow it's nothing like you know just unmute yourself and if you are comfortable switch on your camera and uh, you know tell like you know what is good about this course what is bad about this course i would uh, i don't uh, some of you are very active like anuj um shubhangi uh, and um mayuri Uh, like i don't want to take names uh, um, you know please, please uh, anybody can go ahead and unmute yourself and and talk uh, about your experience in this course uh, so it would be very helpful for us to you know understand uh, from the learners perspective what we are missing so that we can uh, you don't have to necessarily you have to price us or something like that you have to just tell you know what is the wrong or like you know you can share both the view points so it would be helpful for us so please uh, come forward as many as possible so tomorrow we have a session at 10:30 to 11 and we have uh, as usual we have a half an hour break and 12 to 1 it's just going to be um uh this validatory function will be there it's nothing just we have some uh, representative from pkc and then agarkar research institute will be there and then you just uh, share your uh, opinion and then we'll close the session and our team from pkc will take care of your certificate and all those things you will it will come to your email so that's uh, with this we'll close today's session and we'll meet you tomorrow at 10:30 for our last and final session Thank you all.
Thank you all and thank you participants. Thank you, Karthik. We'll end thank this. You, thank you, ma'am.